Well, good morning, and uh, thanks for, for having me here. And uh, now you have to switch your mindset to a more scientific subject. And um, let me start with that. So I've, as, uh, as you heard, I'm, I'm in the biotech industry for yeah, more than 20 years now. Uh, molecular diagnostics, oncology, uh, highly sensitive detection technologies. And uh, on that path, you, you learn a lot. And uh, what we're talking about today is how do you apply, um, let's call it high-end analytical solutions to, to address really pressing needs in, uh, in healthcare. And um, although that sounds a little bit audacious that you can actually monitor cancer patients extremely well from a urine sample. I'll uh, share with you a little bit about how this is done, and uh, at the end of it, you may believe me that this is a, a solution that is robust today and, and helps people today. So why do we want to um, look at cancer from a molecular perspective? Why do we why should we not be that interested in the tumor per se, but more in what causes the tumor? Well, because we understand it now. We know today cancer is a disease of DNA, that every cancer starts with DNA changes in individual cells, that this can be heterogeneous, that when I get a biopsy from a tumor, that I may not necessarily catch the driver mutations that are reside elsewhere if I biopsy one metastasis that I don't know what makes the other tick. And there's a strong need to get a holistic idea of what drives a patient's cancer. And particularly, there's a strong need to know that because we have today, we begin to have targeted therapies that can treat cancer on the basis of knowing what genomically drives them. We have, if you want so, cruise missiles for genomic cancer types. But if we don't know the type of that cancer, then which weapon do we pick? So we need to know what makes a cancer tick. And um, that's not what Trovagen has figured out or what, what we have figured out. If, if you listen to Francis Collins, the director of the NIH, he would tell you today, classify a cancer genomically. That's much more interesting from a treatment perspective than knowing where it sits in your body. And uh, if you follow late scientific literature, you will read that people are starting to figure out how to track cancer from a systemic sample, how to look at the molecular fingerprint that cancer cells will leave in your bloodstream and eventually also in urine. Um, so what do we want to do with this? Today, a cancer patient comes to the hospital and uh, they are diagnosed. Uh, then there's an imaging procedure performed and a drug is given and then they're sent home and six, eight weeks later or two months later, they are coming back, they have an imaging study done and then you have a first idea whether your treatment is working. How about we figure out exactly what drives that cancer, give them a targeted therapy, and tell you a week later whether it works or not? That would be kind of better. And we can do that today. And uh, I'm repeating myself from a urine sample. Um, where you want to use it today is you have a later stage cancer patient that needs targeted therapy. You can figure out from that urine sample, uh, which mutation drives that cancer. You select your drug accordingly. But eventually, you want to move that forward to earlier stage cancers. And follow me here uh, uh, with an argument. If we agree that cancer is a disease of DNA, why do we then demand that we need to see a tumor before we treat it? Why would we then not treat the emergence of mutational signals that say there is DNA damage in the cellular population in this person. Let's treat that DNA damage before there is a tumor. That's, that's how you will eventually win in combination with immunotherapies and treatments that treat the metabolic environment of the tumor and so on. So, uh, and as you go earlier and earlier in the, in the treatment paradigm, you're pushing the envelope of sensitivity. You're really looking for the needle in the haystack you're looking at 100,000 BRAF genes, and you're looking for one that has a mutation. And uh, that's where you really push the system. So um, why do we believe it is required? Why do, why do we believe it is it's important that we have uh, a reliable solution to track a cancer from, from a non-invasive sample? Well, 
simply because we are spending today billions of dollars on alternative methods that are not giving us this information. You know, we're, we're performing endless imaging studies on these cancer patients that only tell us, oops, there's more cancer now, but you learn it weeks before there are molecular signals that tell you that there will be progression, and you get no information about what drug to now pick. What am I going to do now? Cancer is progressing. What am I going to do? I have no understanding of what driver mutation has now taken over. Um, tissue biopsies, that's what people perform today. They are costly. Uh, they have serious adverse events. And, and again, let's say you have a patient that is metastatic. Am I going to biopsy every metastasis? It's not doable. And there was, for, for 20 years, people spoke a lot about circulating tumor cells. We now to know we, we don't find these in every patient. And, uh, and uh, when we find them, we have really no idea whether they are representative of the entire disease spectrum. And then there are traditional cancer markers that simply answer none of the questions that enable picking the right drug for the patient. So how does this molecular fingerprint, this genetic signature that tells us what makes a cancer tick, how does it arrive in your urine? Well, cancer cells, if you want so, they're kind of zombie cells. They, they, they grow faster, but they grow in a disorganized uh, tissue type, and, and they're genomically unhealthy. So they also die faster than, than normal uh, somatic cells. And as they die, they lice, and they release their molecular content into the bloodstream, and then the DNA of that cancer cell gets broken up. And when the pieces are small enough, they pass through your kidney into your urine, which is essentially concentrated plasma, and there you can find them. Well, if you can, um, we can. So why, 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 would you, why would you use urine? And, and uh, when we started with that work four years ago, my son was 11 years old, and I asked him, why would we use urine? And, and he said, well, because you can. And uh, that, that's, a, that's a true answer, but let, let's, uh, let's go a little bit more into the detail. I mentioned before, you're looking for a needle in a haystack. Compared to a blood sample, we can get 10 times more DNA from a urine sample. So 10 times better chance to see a rare event. It's entirely non-invasive. I can do it as often as I want. And I can do it from home. And, and you know, some of you, you may have heard yesterday that, for example, United Healthcare, as of yesterday, covers Doctors on Demand, uh, an app that many of you may have on your, on your iPhone. Well, if you don't go to your doctor anymore, how do you get your sample to him? That would be the way to do it. How do we do this technically? Well, we select for the very, very small snippets in urine. We select for what traditionally people consider DNA trash. Actually, that's what it is. Uh, and we purify that and enrich that. And then we use very specific enrichment amplification to elevate the mutational signal out of the noise and then we throw it on a next-gen sequencer as a detector, which is a technology that you all may have heard of, has become very affordable and very powerful, and can be used today in, uh, in uh, diagnostic practice. And what you get is an incredibly sensitive, single molecule sensitive analytical solution that allows you to quantify a cancer mutational signal over a very wide range and tells you what is going on in that patient effectively in real time. And to uh, skip over that, or, well, let me say very quickly something to that. So what are we doing with this right now? We are now showing that this clinically works. That's, of course, always interesting. We are showing, uh, if I take a biopsy from a patient, could I also see that mutation in the urine? Because if I could, I could save the biopsy. And then I give that patient their drug, and I watch them over time. I say, well, am I knocking that mutation down? And does knocking the mutation down mean that the patient is responding? That is the holy grail. And eventually, you want to show, well, if I can do this, and if I use this information to manage that patient, they're going to live longer. That's, of course, why we are doing this. And they have higher quality of life, and we don't have to spend that much money on therapies that don't work for them and they don't have to run to the hospital every two weeks, and so on. So this is by now already a pretty massive clinical program, and I point out to UCSD here, and I'll show you some really cool data. 
that we have generated here uh, in the Morse Cancer Center, maybe, maybe a mile away from here. Um, so this is not early science anymore. This is happening in, in cancer centers around the world. A um, few examples. We started with histiocytic disease simply because it's clinically a very interesting, rare condition that has only very recently been f recognized as a cancer that has been in 2010, 2011 thought to be an autoimmune disease. And now we know that there are these infiltrating histiocytes that attack tissue and drive functional loss. Many of these are actually cancerous. They're malignant. They carry a mutation. And when you find that mutation, you can effectively cure that patient because it is a cancer without a tumor. It's, it's, it's just these traveling histiocytes. And if you don't find that mutation, that patient is in real trouble, has a poor diagnosis. So uh, keep that in mind. When you get the bad news that the person has cancer, the best news you can get after that is that you found the mutation that drives it, because then you can treat it. And um, in this example here, histiocytic disease, in half of the patients, there's not even an attempt made to get a biopsy. And when you get a biopsy, in about 30% of the cases, it fails to give you an answer. There are no histiocytes in. And remember, every single patient who is found BRAF positive in this condition, that's today a life judge, a judgment. You will live. And if it's not found, you will die. So um, as you see here on the, on the right side, that you form a simple urine sample can type every single patient while biopsies fail you in half of them, and in the half where you get the biopsy, you still get only two-thirds called. That in itself is a huge deal. And uh, then it gets better. You can watch that mutation over time, and you can very precisely tell from that urine sample that you're knocking that mutation down and that that patient gets better. No MRI anymore, no CT scan, no X-ray, just pee. So now this patient here is very, very interesting because that patient educated us that in a week of stopping therapy, you can see from that mutational signal that they're progressing. And then we went to UCSD and said, hey, we don't want to sample these patients monthly. We want to sample them daily. We believe it's not going to take us weeks to tell whether they respond. We believe we can do it in days. And we did that in non-small cell lung cancer where a lot of mutations are understood, a lot of targeted therapies are available, and there are multiple points of intervention for a genomic profiling tool. And here are now these really cool data that uh, uh, Dr. Hatim Hussein presented two weeks ago at the European Lung Cancer Conference and that uh, made a, a room twice as large as this, so quiet that you could hear a pin drop. What you see there at the beginning of that chart, at the very left, you see peaks. So you give the patient the drug, and within two, three days of giving the drug, you see massive dying of cancer cells. And they release their molecular content in the bloodstream and in the urine. That's the bucket where you catch them, and you see these spikes. You can give a high-powered drug, and within a week you know it works. And uh, that is pretty spectacular. And if you look at the red line on top, how not decisive imaging as a clinical tool is in this regard, that imaging gives you a vague trend here. And the genomic signal in urine gives you a discrete yes or no answer in days. So we've tried that out in colorectal cancer, massive clinical program going on there. And to uh, just so you understand how simple that, that interpretation is, these here are two stage four colon cancer patients that were assumed to have metastasis only in the liver. And these patients can be cured through surgery with a 50% probability. Now you think about that. What do you think? The patient on the left side, was the surgery successful? Obviously, within 24 hours of performing surgery, no detectable mutational signal, that patient is now living for five years and is still doing fine. On the right side, within a day of surgery, massive surge of signal that patient passed away within a year. 
Now, now think about that. You have a cancer patient, you say, I performed surgery on you. Maybe you are okay, it's 50-50, come back in two months, and then we're gonna look. Or you say, hey, we performed the surgery on you yesterday, and you are good. We performed the surgery, and we failed. We need to put you on chemo. It's pretty obvious what you would like. So that also works in pancreatic cancer, also a lot of clinical uh, work done there. Pancreatic cancer is notoriously hard to stage. You don't know, should I operate on that patient? Will that patient respond to chemo or not? It's very, very difficult cancer, and that's why the prognosis is very poor. Without going into too much detail, your urine sample tells you what to do. And uh, last but not least, melanoma. That's what we started with. We used our BRAF V600E assay to look at melanoma patients. And uh, I want to show you the first four patients that we looked at with MD Anderson. And uh, you will get an idea why we became incredibly excited about that after only four patients. We have by now looked at about three and a half thousand. And, um, and our excitement is still going strong. But what you see here on the upper right is a lung cancer patient who is BRAF positive and not responding to BRAF therapy alone anymore. And then an attempt is made to change treatment. Another targeted therapy is added. And then you look at where that mutational signal goes. And again, you all can interpret that very discrete result, failure of therapy. And uh, as I mentioned before, we can tell you that today within days. The graph to the right, different. Their chemotherapy was added to a, a colorectal cancer patient who had BRAF a positive cancer. The chemotherapy sensitized the cancer again. Excellent response and another two years of high quality life with, with, with relatively manageable side effects. Patient to the bottom left, metastatic melanoma, responds beautifully to therapy. And the patient on the bottom right, that's maybe the most important chart. Right? That's a non-small cell lung cancer patient who was found on May 22 to have a faint BRAF signal. And the second measuring point is three weeks later, screaming cancer. And that, that's the, the most important message here. You don't have two months or three months or four months time to figure out what's going on in that patient. Maybe in prostate cancer you have that. But in the cancers that are killing people, you don't have that time. And that's why we need a precision cancer monitoring solution that allows you to navigate your cancer within days. Shouldn't use the term your cancer, but it's unfortunately such. Probability for men, one in three. For women, excuse me, for men, one in two. And for women, one in three in their lifetime. It's becoming very personal to all of us. And I'll leave it there. 13 seconds. <laughs> Thank you.